girls. I want glasses taped in the middle kind of love. I want superhero on your t-shirt kind of love. I want messy, awkward, sticky, awkward, horrible, funky kind of love. I want a girl who can talk dirty and elvish. A girl who, when she's angry at me, sometimes yells, Come! A girl who, when she's having an orgasm, sometimes yells, Come! I want 12 sided dyes, you just anal beads kind of love. Okay. That one might have been a little too much. See, I want a girl will stay up late with me to watch Adult Swim while we cuddle on the couch. A girl who understands that watching Battlestar Galactica or Comic Book Reading Time is a time for silence, but watching Bill Big Lebowski or Holy Grail is a time for screaming at the screen. A girl who judges the milestones in her life by episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> Screw Willow, screw Buffy, I want a Willow. Seasons one through three Willow. If you actually got that reference, I will buy you a beer as soon as I get off stage. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you get the references. This is more than about being a nerd. This is about devotion. A girl who will yell the lines to my poems back to me when I'm on stage when I forget them. Wrap me in your geekiness. Show me the depth of your awkwardness and insecurities. We'll dive in wholeheartedly together, and when we climb back out, we'll make a stop at the backs of my retinas so you can see how beautiful you look through my eyes. We will dance, even when we think people are laughing at us. Fuck it. Because people are laughing at us, getting funky fresh with our spastic cells, this is nerd love, and when they see our unabashed joy in each other's petty obsessions, they will be dumbstruck with fear when they see how hollow their love is compared to ours, because only people like you and me knew how hard it was to even find this person in the first place. We will show them what real love looks like. Damn it. Nerdiness, be prepared. <laughs> All right. Uh, or maybe not, because this isn't that nerdy. Uh, <laughs> Wizard of Oz, I hope you're all yeah. uh, you're familiar with. Uh, so I have this series of poems that I've written that are just takes like fairy tale or fantasy characters and just skews really dark with them. Uh, this is called Cowardly. I know the rumble now. The breaks still mourn the one time I was not brave enough to speak, face the witch of the west for you, wept at your leaving because the words wouldn't come. If I had had the courage to tell you how we all really felt, if the scarecrow had the knowledge of foresight, the tin man, the fragility of his own heart, if I had known the price of wearing this crown, what this world would become in your absence, I never would have allowed you to leave us. How desperate the people of this world long for order. Without a wizard, the peoples of Oz chose me to rule them. How humanity loves their dichotomies. They cling to them as if the world is defined by the me, the beast. I took the next most beautiful thing left in Oz as my queen, the scarecrow as my advisor. He has become so cold in your leaving. His heart, dry and brittle, has since crumbled away. The tin man, long rusted, shut again, this time voluntarily. The things I have done to keep this empire safe. Glenda's skin started to turn green at some point after the munchkins began to starve. Who knew that freeing them from bondage would be their eventual undoing? A group of flying monkeys went feral. They circle munchkin land like vultures. Those that didn't are now my private Gestapo. I am still too much coward to end this. A cub pretending to be a man, pretending to be a lion. Did you know that solitary male lions are three times as likely to die young? I have no pride to keep me going. Who knew that in every dictator, every man given power he has not earned is a coward's heart, a beast in waiting. The things we are too afraid to do ourselves, we, simple order, we simply order others to do in our name. This must be what starting a religion is like. Our only savior 
carried away in a balloon, always slowly fading into the distance. Oh. Hug that book. Yeah, this is a chat book. They are five dollars. Uh, I have other ones that are ten, but that's because they have a sort of a technologically inclined a download code for an audio <laughs> album. Uh, let's do this. I should do this by memory, but I don't. Alice at 50 writes to her old friend Cheshire. Started to agree with the people who tell me it never happened. I think it's easier that way. They say story. Adolescent fantasy, drug-induced frenzy hallucination, your floating grin, no body, no face, just eyes and teeth, substitution for some face I've not allowed myself to see. Years of therapy tell me you are some sort of coping mechanism, that the caterpillar is a giant smoking phallic symbol, a metaphor for some childhood trauma, the Mad Hatter is a drunken father, an overly touchy-feely neighbor, the looking glass, some sort of body acceptance metaphor, the jabberwocky, the horror in my own reflection, all different faces for something they tell me I refuse to deal with. They say all the drink me, eat me should have clued me in. They're, they don't know. There is... No metaphor here. No mechanism. Nothing funny in my father's tea and cake. No pedophilic neighbor. I am not in denial about anything. I was there. You know, Cheshire, they never believe me. They've simply forgotten how to be children, forgotten a story can exist simply for the sake of its own wonder. They tell me you are not real. That this cold gray I have known for so long is the real world. That this loneliness is of my own doing. I can't feel anything here anymore. In Wonderland, I was confused, maybe frightened at times, but never broken. They tell me I am broken, Cheshire. The last time I saw the white rabbit, his watch had cracked. He was crying, Cheshire. Knew he had some place to be, but didn't know when he needed to be there. Whether he had gone there already, he reminded me so much of my father then. They tell me he was. That I should stop hiding behind the stories to grow up that this adult world is so ugly. I miss your smile. I miss my friends. The white rabbit has been dead for so long now. The rabbit hole is gone or lost. I only know I can't find it. So I've started digging. I buried the white rabbit in the yard. There are so many things buried here. I am falling now. I've been falling for so long, I know one day I will stop. I know I'm coming home. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I do a poem I've been doing a lot because I am hoping to God it's not prophetic. <laughs> and I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be really obnoxious and loud, so I'm just not. Gonna... Yell at it. Four stages in the doomed relationship. One, initiation. Before, there was a lot of not you in my life, so it was easier not to think about you constantly. But now, well, now there's a lot less not you, and in a concerted effort not to think about you. Well. I've been thinking about you a lot. <laughs> the other day, a friend of mine told me, I mentioned your name six times in 20 minutes, and all I could think was, damn. See, I know this story. I know exactly where it ends, but it doesn't matter. I sleep in spurts now. I don't trust this feeling. It's a lie. Two, infatuation. There is a creepy romanticism here. Three, the semblance of love. She, is smile thrown backwards against the sky, schoolyard butterflies made out of flames rumbling into my chest every time I hold her hand, the scent of her body on the bed, the sense memory that spells out the words home every time, body, 
where I still believe God exists, like it's the last place he cared enough to show off every instrument of a testament to faith in sacred ground. We are tucked under the covers, hoping if we hold tight enough, we can become one person. There is no place more peaceful than these moments. Sometimes I think this is all we get, what's left behind when everything else turns to dust. We are eagles with wings outstretched, floating on updrafts of each other's empty spaces, talons clasped and spiraling. We never notice the ground is coming up fast. Four, it's inevitable. I try not to think about it. I know enough to know when there's too much backstory to deal with. I can't compete with that. I shouldn't have to, see so you were here. And this, it's all the guidance you should have needed. I find myself trying too hard to smile, trying too hard to look happy at parties. I swear, every time I see someone who looks like you from the back, a little burning sensation lodges itself in the part of my heart where you used to live. I don't think I was ever in love with you. That doesn't stop you from invading the parts of my subconscious I thought were finally safe. Other women can smell the desperation on me, feel the cold of your ghostly shadow every time I hold them, but I hope one of them can feel the space you left. Fill it up with all this not you. I've been missing. Wow. Wow. You got a little short one? Short one? Yeah, do it short. Okay, we're going to do the really short... Uh, Uh, silliness. No, okay, I'm gonna do something that is really terrible. Uh, but I have to share it because I've been sharing it with everybody. Uh, and you need to know about this. I, I've stolen it from, uh, uh, it's a game by a comedian named Kevin Pollock. It's called the Larry King Game. And I need to share this with you. Oh, it's great. Is you do a bad Larry King impression. <laughs> And then you have Larry share something with the audience that no one needs to know. And then you throw to a goofy part of the country. So one of the ones that I came up with, and I'm going to leave you on, and I kind of apologize, but I don't care. because I, like <laughs> I like goofy, stupid things. Is, uh, I am not in fact wearing pants. These suspenders are what is holding up the loose folds of my leg skin. <laughs> Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, you're on the line. <laughs> Thank you so much.